We'll start with crew patch again and a view from orbit. Uh, the crew patch is still flying on orbit, uh, firmly affixed to the bulkhead of Mir in the core module. Uh, meanwhile, uh, before dawn, the uh, vehicle was prepped on the pad. We actually woke up uh, before midnight. Launch morning for us was actually launch afternoon as we were already operating on Moscow time. We'd had a significant sleep shift. Here, uh, getting into the suits after the uh, morning or afternoon for us, uh, weather brief. We had a chance to take a look at uh, the, what the Tau weather was, what the forecast for the Cape was. Uh, Chris had already been through his suit pressure checks. He was obviously ready to go. Uh, Jerry's always ready. And uh, we had just got back from uh, weather, uh, weather briefs and checks. Bill also had already completed all that work. And we had a little bit of a chance to relax in the uh, chairs there before it was time to come out. Well, here we are coming out of the ONC. And one of the most pleasant surprises, in addition to some of the media that was there to take our picture, was to see some of the same faces I see here today enjoying this briefing. They were there to greet us and to give us a bon voyage on our way. So thanks for the, our training team and the rest of the people who traveled down there to say goodbye. We saw a beautiful sunrise over the Atlantic Ocean, and then we got to go from launch from LCC. Kim waved uh, goodbye at two minutes prior to launch, and at six seconds prior, the main engines cranked up, and exactly on time, the solid rocket boosters ignited, and the hold-down bolts let go, and we were on our way. And there's absolutely no doubt at this point in your mind that you know you're going somewhere. The, uh, the, the first stage ride is, is uh, buckboard rough. It, it's a lot of vibration, a lot of noise. It's an impressive thing to be a part of. We punched through a, uh, a low cloud deck right there, and came out the other side, and, and the people who had assembled for our launch got one last view of us as we headed out over, over the Atlantic Ocean. A uh, second stage ride is incredibly smooth, just as rough as first stage is. Second stage is just incredibly smooth and quiet. Once we got on orbit and opened up the payload bay doors, uh, here's an example of some of the beautiful views that we got. These are the snow-covered Pyrenees Mountains, France to the north, Spain to the south, the islands of Mallorca and Menorca right here. and. Uh, this is actually a better view than I often got from space because I'm not having to compete with the other four guys for a, <laughs> a window room right here. One of the first orders of business was to assemble the docking module in the bay. Um, and that involved uh, using the Canadarm. And I had the honor of being the first Canadian to ever operate the Canadarm up in space. So it was a real thrill for me to use this big piece of equipment to install this large five-ton uh, five Russian docking module onto the top of the orbiter docking station here in preparation for attaching it to Mir. I used a bunch of different visual cues. Uh, space vision system was one of them, which looked at the dots here, compared them to the dots up here, and gave me relative position inside the cockpit. I also had this view here, which is a centerline camera. You can see there's an actual reflection in this mirror of the camera itself. And by the camera looking at its own reflection, I could align things very carefully. But well, we got it uh, carefully in position within about uh, fractions of an inch and fractions of a degree, and then Ken fired the thrusters and slammed the two mechanisms home. And it worked exactly like all of the people at JSC had told us. Uh, and the mechanism just worked perfectly to lock them together. Now, after we had uh, uh, successfully installed the docking module, now it came time for our next big task was to put the dock, take the docking module to its home in space. And uh, it was, we could see Mir from a long way out. Um, the initial burns were done up on the forward flight deck, and then uh, we moved, uh, uh, Ken moved back to the uh, aft flight deck so we could uh, continue with our operations. Uh, here you can see uh, I'm uh, working with the uh, rendezvous uh, computers. Uh, Chris was taking uh, shots out the overhead window with the lasers. Uh, here he is taking the uh, handheld laser marks. We also had two uh, laser systems in the payload bay, and uh, it was great. It was a beautiful sight. As we got closer to Mir, I think the activity on the flight deck increased. Uh, Chris began to really operate the cameras. Bill shifted over to lasers as the TCS dropped offline. Uh, Jim was busy uh, keeping track of the timing and the timeline and the orbiter. And Jerry shot a lot of these pictures as well as operated the IMAX camera. I think this is where you see that all the training and teamwork uh, really come into play because everybody was uh, doing all the things we've been trained to do. We were working very closely. And we were able to bring these two pieces of Russian hardware together uh, on orbit 215 miles up, uh, exactly where the Russians wanted them. And as you'll see from the outside view, the, uh, the whole operation proceeded very gradually. There in the lower right, you can see the view if you were sitting out on the left wingtip as these two parts come together. You might have noticed that we had a little trouble with that target. Some of the paint had peeled back, and uh, that uh, will be replaced in future. 
Here, just about this point, the orbiter jets fired and accelerated the two pieces of hardware together. The latch was captured, and uh, we were docked to Mir. At this point, all the activity on the inside shifted to operating the APDS and drawing the two vehicles together. Well, this is our first chance to relax just a little bit and give us a chance to really get a, a great view of the, uh, the Mir space station as we were also going through a series of pressure checks which would allow us to open up the hatches in between. We also had a chance to capture on film the, uh, one of the solar rays right out the overhead window as it was uh, rotating to track the sun as we kept our merry go, go around around the world. Here's Ken opening up the hatch uh, that goes from the docking module into the crystal module of Mir. And as he opened up the hatch, uh, the Mir crew was very excited to come in and, and see everybody. They'd been on over for about two and a half months at this point. This is the commander, Sergei, uh, Yuri, sorry, Yuri. And here's Thomas, the German ESA cosmonaut. And Sergei Avdev, the uh, board engineer, will be coming through in just a second here. After this was completed, we went back into the mirror and uh, conducted a series of, uh, of video cons down to the ground, and then we went right back to work. What we're going to show you here is a transfer of the protein crystal growth experiment from the shuttle over to the mirror space station, and then uh, we returned a similar experiment that had been placed there by STS-71 uh, and returned it back to the orbiter. Uh, what we're trying to give you here is an impression, as you saw in the slides, for the the length of the runs in the various different modules, but also the amount of clutter and stowage that has uh, accumulated over the 10 years of living in space with various different mere crews. As Chris uh, indicated earlier, we did uh, transfer over uh, 2,000 pounds of hardware and, and supplies to the uh, mirror uh, station. And in addition, we returned something in excess of 800 pounds of equipment and uh, experimental results that uh, scientists will be looking at for some time to come. This is going right through the base block of the uh, mirror and into the Cravant 1 module. And you're seeing uh, Yuri and Sergey remove the old PCG experiment, and I'm handing them a new one. In addition to the science we had on board, we also realized that we were these people's only visitors in a six-month stay on orbit. And we tried to bring them things that would improve the quality of their life, which here included ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> and I have never seen three grown men eat ice cream as uh, happily as those three guys did. <laughs> See, eating up an ice cream sandwich, and then uh, Yuri floats the last of his little mini dove bar into his mouth there. And they, they were very happy that, that we had thought of this and brought them those, exper uh, those uh, experiments. Those, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my lips were moving. Hey, uh, brought them that. But the gift that uh, I think really meant the most was to bring Thomas this guitar. Um, they have this old guitar that actually went up in Salyut 7. It's one of the oldest items in space. It's been up there for 15 years. We brought him a new classical practice guitar and had this opportunity to play together and sing in the Mir core, which was just very memorable for both of us. Well, we did uh, actually do quite a bit of work while we were up there. Uh, you could see the arm in position to uh, gather data from Mir jet firings, part of a series of experiments. Uh, in which we were trying to get data that will help us uh, understand how the shuttle will inter interact with the International Space Station. It was really quite a thrill to be maneuvering the arm or in, in proximity to the solar arrays, and uh, as it turned out, it was quite a thrill for uh, Yuri to see that as well. Here you can see uh, things are starting to get ready to take a little bit sadder note. Uh, these are folks that we became close friends with on orbit, uh, correction, on the ground, and became just lifelong friends with on orbit. And unfortunately, at some point, it was time to say goodbye. And here, as was quite appropriate, uh, Ken is the last one uh, from the Atlantis crew to leave, uh, to leave Mir. And we closed the hatch. And then the next day, it was uh, time to actually uh, undock, uh, do our fly around, and then get ready to come home. Actually, uh, before we undock, we did have one last opportunity to wave goodbye. From our overhead windows, we could see the uh, one uh, or several of the windows of Mir. And here we are waving uh, a final goodbye to our, to our compatriots up there. And then the, uh, it was time to actually do the undocking. With Ken at the controls, we released the hooks that were holding us in place, and springs pushed us away. Ken fired the jets right about here to get about a 0.2 uh, foot per second opening rate. And then from there, orbital mechanics accelerated our, our, uh, our, our rate of separation from Mir. There's a good picture of the thing that we got the privilege to add to Mir, the docking module. 
we had these pictures taken by the Mir crew as we uh, continued to move away. We moved out to a range of about 500, 525 feet from Mir. As we uh, moved to that distance, Mir rotated back to uh, its solar inertial attitude that would put its uh, solar, solar panels in the most advantageous orientation to the sun. Kim was generous enough to relinquish uh, the controls for a period of time during the fly around to let me get the opportunity to experience uh, for the first time what it's like to fly the shuttle in space, and I really appreciated that. We flew two loops around Mir, two complete loops around Mir, and then Kim from the uh, forward compartment actually uh, did the separation burn uh, that finally separated us away from Mir. Well, the commander never let us forget that he was, in fact, a Marine colonel. And he was always up at the crack of dawn, in fact, before many times. And here he is shaving, and he's uh, already racked the rest of the crew out of their bunks and getting us ready to uh, start on another busy day of activities on orbit. You see uh, Chris and uh, Jim shaving, and uh, Jim was one of these guys that did a lot of parallel ops. He's also brushing his teeth at the same time. <laughs> Uh, Jim's still brushing his teeth, and now, <laughs> and now Bill got into the act, and you see uh, Chris in the background there, he's reading his electronic mail. Well, Ken, as I said, was uh, always uh, anxious to make sure that his troops stayed in good shape, uh, kind of like a Marine drill sergeant, and here's Chris getting in some morning exercise. And uh, I was uh, more into doing laps, so here I am getting some laps in on the mid-deck before the busy day's activities start. And you think that's easy to do, huh? <laughs> well, we demonstrate a little bit of physics. Here's a conservation of angular momentum as uh, we spin Chris around in the mid-deck. It's rather tight, but as he expands his legs and arms, you can see that his rotational rate slows down, and then when he brings them back together, it picks up again. Chris had told you during the slides that uh, seeing sunrises and sunsets is one of our favorite things on orbit. and. Uh, this, this video gives you a good feeling for how rapidly a sunset, in this case, occurs. And uh, we'll cut away to, a, I think, which is a very nice sequence here of you seeing from the elbow camera the sunset as it occurs on the orbiter. And you see that we have the lights on in the orbiter and continue to work through the dark periods of the orbit. Uh, we still had some secondary payloads and science to conduct prior to coming home. You can see we have a yaw rate. This is looking out the aft windows at a nighttime view of the horizon. And you're going to see the rocket, the, uh, the primary RTS jets fire, as Ken commands the orbiter to stop that yaw rate. And the, uh, as impressive as it is here, the oohs and ahs coming from the MSs at the aft flight deck looking out the window at this, uh, they were impressive, impressed also. Uh, shortly thereafter, it was time to do the flight control system check in order to get ready to come home. Here you see Ken uh, and myself and Jerry also going through that uh, fairly long procedure to make sure that all the APUs, the flight control systems, and the computers are ready to support entry. Here you'll see the hydraulically powered Elevons going through one of their test sequences. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, actually the next day, it was time to come home. As the orbiter re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, we experience temperatures on the outside of up to about 2,800 degrees. And that ionizes the atmosphere and leaves a contrail behind us that any jet would be proud to lay down. Here's a picture of that contrail going back behind us. And if you, I think you could really see it for about 1,000 miles behind us. You can see the glow behind Ken. And here's Jerry demonstrating that, yes, we are starting to re-enter the Earth's gravitational field. Uh, out my window was the most spectacular view. We had to pull our flight track about 600 miles south. So we were banked to the right, and that gave me the prime window real estate. And this is from about 235,000 feet, about 50 miles in altitude, uh, going over the Canadian Cascades and Rockies. And that gives you a real feel for just the sensation of speed that you get at this point in the entry. Well, Jim was doing a lot more than giving us a travel log across that high altitude scorching path uh, down across the northern United States. But here, the whole crew on the flight deck, and I know the training team often wondered what we were doing up there in the motion base. And uh, this is how it looked. We were uh, busy monitoring the uh, displays, watching the orbiter, keeping track of uh, all of the systems as we headed down, uh, getting set up for the uh, intercept of the hack. Here, out the right-hand window, you can see some familiar territory, the uh, vehicle assembly building, as we lined up for the uh, final approach on to runway 33. It was cloudy that day. In fact, we logged an instrument approach on this one. Uh, we penetrated an overcast. 
And uh, here, as we come down about uh, 2,000 feet, the pre-flare was initiated. And here, the landing gear, uh, Jim lowered at 300 feet as we lined up uh, on 3-3. It was a good day for flying and soaring, as you could see from that uh, little clip of the Eagle. Slight crosswind, but we had uh, overall good conditions. Uh, the lighting was just about perfect. We touched down and then uh, rolled out on 3-3. Here, we're using the aerodynamic braking and then the uh, drag chute, which has been a recent addition, but a real uh, brake saver, as uh, we used very little braking coming down the runway and uh, decelerating on the center line. This particular view on the next shot gives you a little bit of an idea how nice it was to bring uh, Atlantis back home. You can see as we rolled out, uh, bringing it to a stop towards the end of the runway, that the uh, launch pad behind us was sort of indicative of all of the phases of shuttle operations as uh, we launched from the background on a, on a morning uh, about a week ago and bring the vehicle back, uh, ready to be towed off and processed for another one. I think very close to the end there, you can see what I have to admit was a sigh of relief as the uh, wheels were stopped and then a chance to uh, thank and congratulate all the uh, crew there on the flight deck. Here we are at the uh, start of the mission and uh, special thanks for the uh, last minute fix to the uh, to the UHF communication system that did manage to get us off the ground. And this particular sli slide shows that hole in the clouds that uh, the weather coordinators were able to find. And as things cleared on that morning, we were able to finally uh, start on our way to the space station Mir. One of the aspects of the mission I wanted to include in a slide presentation was a little uh, vignette of life on board Mir. And this is in the core module of the Russian space station. And uh, Chris and Bill, who proved to be very enthusiastic with uh, all aspects of the mission, particularly enjoyed the amateur radio payload, as we all did. And here, uh, they took a few moments to try out the Russians' radio. And I think that uh, part of the international aspect of the mission was uh, highlighted when uh, the Mir Atlantis complex was flying over Canada, and a Canadian was on a Russian radio talking to uh, folks at home. And uh, Bill uh, and Chris took turns on that radio. I think it was a little difficult to decide who was going to get to talk next. But uh, we all were very enthusiastic during that all, whole period. But this, I thought, showed a lot of what was, uh, this joint venture was all about. One other aspect of the mission that uh, is worth mentioning is also characterized by this particular photo. We had another one that was difficult to get all of us in the photo since the photography was difficult. But what you see here are representatives of Russia, uh, Germany, or the European Space Agency, the uh, NASA, and the Canadian Space Agency, all participants in a uh, combined space flight. Behind us is the United Nations flag. With it uh, is the US, Russian, ESA, and Canadian flag, somewhat obscured. And we're holding the uh, copies of the uh, United Nations Space Treaty, and also of great interest to astronauts uh, and cosmonauts is the uh, uh, part of that treaty that deals with the uh, uh, aid and uh, help to uh, space travelers uh, in the event of any uh, landings in unforeseen uh, locations. So we flew the uh, UN flag and those um, scrolls to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Boutros, Boutros Ghali, uh, called at that time and spoke to us. Uh, in fact, the flag was launched aboard Soyuz, was flown aboard the Mir Atlantis complex, and returned to Earth on Atlantis. And uh, we're all looking forward to seeing our uh, Mir crewmates again in April when we return to uh, the United, United Nations headquarters to return these articles uh, to their rightful home. The uh, picture here is a crew photo. Uh, and it's a uh, rather unique one, I think, in that it was taken with the help of uh, our uh, Mir crewmates. And in the uh, overhead windows there, you can see five uh, uh, smiling faces. And that was all of us uh, taking a look at our home and take with a snapshot uh, from the uh, Russian space station. And uh, this was the, uh, the kind of spirit that was present all the time in Atlantis. We were all, uh, during the rendezvous, during the undocking, everybody wanted to be up in those windows. But uh, we were all very excited to be there and uh, I think awed by the size of the Mir space station and, uh, and all that this mission represented.
difficult to see from the side of the slides in focus. Okay, thank you. While docked with Mir, we had uh, a pretty full plate of tasks to do. Uh, a lot of transfer. We transferred about a ton of gear across, 2,000 pounds, including the water and all of the items. And one of the items that we, or two of the items we had to transfer were these uh, large blue boxes, uh, TEF, which is thermoelectric freezers. And that's uh, Thomas Reiter, the German cosmonaut, holding them. And he's inside Spectre, uh, which was launched earlier this year. So that's how it looks now up in orbit. And not only is Spectre the laboratory that Thomas does most of his work in, but it's also uh, where he sleeps and lives. He's got his uh, bedroll laid out on the floor of Spectre. And he was pretty happy uh, to see the docking module dock. I think he was eyeing that as his potential birth from now on. <laughs> we brought these TEF lids up uh, as a new design. So uh, Jerry went through and changed those out with Thomas's help on board. All in all, we were planning to transfer about 1,000 pounds of water. And uh, there's a bit of an incompatibility between the two space vehicles. On the shuttle, of course, we purify or, or keep our water clean with an iodine uh, content. And on Mir, they use silver biocide. And the silver and the iodine aren't compatible. So we needed to remove the iodine from our water and then inject silver biocide into it so that they could store it and use it on board Mir. I'm here in the mid deck, and I was, uh, I did eight out of the 10 bags that we did. So I was largely the main Gunga Din on board, creating and transporting the water. Um, you can see in my left hand is the hose that comes from the galley that's pumping our iodinated water, and then it goes through that long silver deiodinating uh, de uh, filter. And then if you look carefully right in the middle of the bag, there's actually a, uh, a syringe where I could inject the silver biocide. But apart from all the transfer, this was a real opportunity for the Mir crew, who had been there since early September, about two and a half months, to come over to a new place. They've been inside the same walls for two and a half months, and they got, took every opportunity they could to come over into the shuttle not only to see another spaceship or to see Earth from a new vantage point, but they could look out the windows and see their own home in a really unique uh, point of view. And they spent a lot of time here on the aft flight deck of the shuttle uh, looking out at the new docking module and looking up at their home in space. This next slide has no people in there, and that's because we'd like to talk a couple of minutes about, about Mir itself. Um, this is a representative sample of, of one of the modules. You'll, you can see that the, uh, at any given point, the walls are kind of close to you, but it, the length and the total volume of Mir is quite impressive. When we first got on board Mir, we found uh, that there were no odors to speak of. The air smelled fine, telling us that their air revitalization system was working just great. You'll notice that there's no particulate matter floating around. That, that means their filter system is working just fine. Uh, the temperatures we found comfortable, and uh, the noise level, we uh, Chris did a lot of tests of the noise level on board Mir, and found that their noise level was roughly compatible with what we had to, uh, to deal with on the shuttle. Uh, the one thing that all of us recognize right away, and especially the people here from crew equipment and stowage, is to all of us, it looks like somebody just threw a hand grenade in here. <laughs> but that represents the, the different philosophies that the Russians use as opposed to the Americans, and it has to do with our short duration missions versus their very long duration missions. Their stowage plan consists of their people being up there for months at a time, and they know exactly where everything is. If you look closely at this picture, despite the apparent disarray, you'll notice that nothing is floating around. Everything is either tied off or tethered off or bungeed off. And uh, at no time during the flight were, uh, were Thomas or Sergey or Yuri unable to find something when we asked for it. They knew exactly where everything was. So there really is a plan and a rhyme and a reason here even though, and, and it's going to be a, a difficult challenge for us to merge our two different philosophies, and this is just one example of that difficulty. This is a very uh, special picture for all of us, and we wanted to end the onboard section of our slide on Mir with this slide. This is a picture of, uh, of Sergey just a couple of hours prior to the final hatch closing, when we would have to go to our vehicle and close the hatch, and we would uh, undock the very next morning. He's writing a letter to his wife, and he's doing it in his little, his little enclave. This is an area that he uh, claimed as his own, and the other Mir cosmonauts uh, respected that claim. He's got some pictures of his family and uh, some religious icons that were important to him on the walls there. He's got his window, and he sleeps in this particular area also in the evening. Um, he stole away for uh, about an hour to write a, a letter to his wife, and then just shortly after this picture was taken, he folded the letter up and stuck it in a packet of material that we were honored to bring down. And I'm sure I speak for all the crew and probably all for of you when I say that there's probably never been any more important airmail ever delivered by an aerospace vehicle 
than the letter that you see him writing here. It's important for us to keep in mind that he and the rest of his crewmates are still up there and they will be for another three months and they're doing important and sometimes difficult work and whatever degree we can help them out on that, that's what the joint program is all about. We'd like to shift gears now and go to what we were able to see from space, some of, the, of our Earth observation photos. I'm sure many of you will recognize this photo right away as New Orleans. It's a place that many of you have had a weekend trip to. This is a picture of Atlanta, another southern town. And uh, what's most apparent in this picture is the Hartsfield Airport right here. And uh, you can see the downtown area of Atlanta right here in this region. Uh, I-20, the same uh, uh, highway that goes across much of the south, you can say, see it goes right through the center of town and takes a little jink here and then continues on eastbound. If you hadn't uh, realized by now, there was uh, significant Canadian involvement in this mission. And, uh, and what was particularly nice was with our inclination at uh, 51.7 uh, degrees, uh, we actually got to see a good bit of at least the southern part of Canada. And uh, needless to say, most of Canada looked like this. It is indeed uh, winter up there, and it's a tad different than our winters. This is, the, uh, this is uh, James Bay. It's the uh, southern end of the Hudson Bay. Um, here you have the Moose River kind of going into uh, uh, James Bay, and there's some interesting uh, linear features you'll notice that tend to sort of parallel the, uh, the, the uh, coastline here. As we're all aware, this was a, an area that uh, experienced significant glaciation uh, in, the, uh, in the world's uh, ge geological history. And as the glaciers receded and the land essentially became lighter, there was a lot of uh, uplifting uh, of the land. And so, in fact, the shores of James Bay uh, have receded over the years, or more accurately, we can say the old shores have risen, uh, resulting in new shores. Um, it's a little town here called uh, Moose Factory, and that was the, uh, uh, one of the original sites of the... Uh, uh, Hudson Bay Trading Post in the 18th century, uh, once again uh, uh, an organization that figures prominently in the history of uh, North America and the settlement of this continent. Uh, and then just a little bit, uh, actually just across the river is uh, Moosonee, and then we have Hannah Bay down here and Rupert Bay. Here's Charlton Island. Once again, uh, the, our uh, meteorologists uh, are real interested in this because we can see a lot of processes occurring around Charlton Island, ice forming out here. Then you can also see evidence of this dry southerly wind coming up over the water and starting to pick up moisture as evidenced by these clouds. Now, I always like to ask kindergartners, is this picture upside down or right side up? And it, of course it depends on your point of view and in space there is no right side up or upside down. But here's a very distinctive feature that I know uh, Ken is particularly fond of. And so uh, right here, if we, go, uh, if we go right off, we can, see, uh, we can see Boston. And as we go back past Cape Cod, see Long Island down here, uh, New York City. Uh, and my apologies uh, to Mr. Abbey. Uh, West Point is located uh, right behind the module here. And uh, we sure enjoyed uh, the game this weekend. And uh, as he mentioned up on the stage, uh, wait till next year. And, and I'm sure uh, his alma mater is going to be uh, ready to uh, return the favor. Uh, we go on down, we get uh, uh, further down Delaware Bay and then the Chesapeake Bay, and we had some just really fantastic panoramic views uh, looking uh, down North America. We finally can see just a little bit of uh, the Outer Banks here, uh, Cape Hatteras, and in some of our pictures we could actually see all the way from New England down to the tip of Florida and uh, Lake Okeechobee. We were real fortunate in this flight that um, we passed out, got some passes over Europe, which were clear, which is uh, a pretty rare occurrence. Uh, and here we are right over the English Channel. Uh, this is the Isle of Wight. Uh, this is Portsmouth here. We have uh, London here, uh, the very famous uh, White Cliffs of Dover, of Dover uh, Cherbourg, France, uh, out on uh, Normandy out here. And uh, there also was a very strong Scottish... Uh, heritage in this uh, crew. Uh, of course, three of us have uh, names of Scottish heritage, and uh, as it turns out, we find out that Hadfield and Halsell even let some Scots into their, uh, into their families sometime in the past, and we could even see as far north as, as uh, Scotland in some of these pictures. 
Well, as Bill said, we had the opportunity to see a good share of, uh, of Europe, and this is a part of central Poland, uh, something that none of us had ever seen, from, at least from this uh, altitude. Uh, the white stripes, as you might guess, are airliners going across the sky and laying out some contrails, and it looks like the predominant wind was from this direction, which is the west or northwest, because you can see older and older contrails. There's probably an air route through here, and there's even a a very new contrail being laid down in here that's rather faint to see. But the predominant feature I wanted to show you is a river that goes through here and up to the north and eventually goes out into the Baltic Sea. Where it goes out into the Baltic Sea is close to the uh, Polish town of uh, Gdansk. And this river starts down way to the south in the uh, Kapian Mountains. Off the screen to the lower right is the capital of Warsaw. We did capture it, at least partially, on another uh, picture in this sequence. The town of Torin is right in this area, and the town of Bromberg, and that's the English version of the name of that town, is down in here. Uh, the interesting thing to point out in this picture, however, is if you look very closely at the river, you actually see little white specks just in a very uh, evenly uh, spaced pattern along the river. And we believe those to be the barge traffic plying back up and forth, up and down the river. A very unique uh, sight for us to be able to see. Well, uh, a little bit further off to the east now, we're into Turkey. And this is the mountainous lake, Lake Van. And right next to it is uh, Numrut Lake. They gave me all these great names to try to pronounce. Uh, this lake is actually in the, uh, the cone of a volcano. And there's a whole series of volcanoes that go up to the east to uh, Mount Ararat, which is off of this view, and slice back down across to the southwest. Uh, these volcanoes are caused by the Saudi Arabian uh, subcontinent continental plate slamming up into into the Europe continent. There is a town in the scene, believe it or not. It's right down here in this little bay. It's called uh, Tatvan. And let me see. Uh, I guess the other things to point out is that this region kind of separates two regions in Turkey, the Armenian region to the north and uh, the Kurdistan region to the south. Another unique sight that we uh, saw with the naked eye, which was kind of surprising to us, is uh, this structure that goes across the plains of Russia. And I don't know if you can see it very well from out there, but in particular, this part stands out very well from my vantage point right here. This is, uh, let me set the stage for you. To the left over here would be the Volga River, about 60 miles away, and up in this direction would be the southern portion of the Ural Mountains. So that would be uh, putting uh, Kazakhstan just to the lower right region of this view, or maybe just off from it. Uh, the interesting thing that I'm pointing out here, however, is a, a windbreak or a shelter of some sort that has been established by the Russians, uh, we are assuming, to uh, cut down uh, the soil erosion or things like that from the very strong winds that are predominant in this region. We're always encouraged to try to keep uh, in contact with uh, natural as well as man-made uh, causes of uh, things that are detrimental to the environment. And we were very fortunate to capture a nice picture of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. Uh, this erupted back in 1991, put out a tremendous amount of ash, which caused uh, the Americans to leave in a more expeditious fashion from Clark Air Force Base and Subic Bay in the Philippines. And let me see if I can figure out where Clark Air Force Base is. It's got to be right down in this area. And Subic Bay is, um, where is it? Over here somewhere. Up here. Is that it? It's kind of hard to see from here. But the main thing to point out is that there had been a very uh, large typhoon. In fact, they call it a super typhoon, uh, Angela, that had just gone across the Philippines about a week or so before we flew over the top of them. 
And what you're seeing is a very large washing of the ash that had been deposited from the eruption further down the slopes of the mountain. And in fact, this one right here caused 1,000 people to be displaced from their temporary lodgings in this area. This is something that uh, future shuttle crews will continue to monitor to uh, see the impacts upon uh, not only the people, but the wildlife and the vegetation in this area. Just going to show you a couple more slides. I'm going to take a run down uh, the Rockies. Starting up in the north, um, it's, a lot of people ask what you can see from space, especially with a light dusting of snow like this across the prairies. It's, it becomes very easy to see towns and the major roads uh, that crisscross uh, that part of the world. This is Calgary here. Um, this is the Bow River coming up from the south. Down to the south is uh, Drumheller and all of the uh, tremendous uh, dinosaur finds that are being uh, excavated right now, dinosaur eggs and, and uh, in fact, infant nests of dinosaurs all to the south of Calgary. Um, and this is the foothills of the Rockies. The Rockies just start right here on the left with the road leading up to Banff and Jasper and some pretty fine skiing up to the left here. Um, the Winter Olympics were in Calgary just a few years ago, and there's a huge ski jump just at the edge of the foothills as well, and some smaller ski hills right on, on the left-hand side of Calgary. And I haven't been able to ski in two years, so I'm talking a lot about ski hills. You know. And this road here is the main highway that leads uh, straight up to Edmonton. It's about the same distance and the same sort of highway as they have between Houston and Dallas. A little further on down uh, comes to Great Salt Lake. And uh, it shows some man-made features really clearly. This uh, train bridge that cuts across Great Salt Lake has divided the waters of Great Salt Lake for several years. And so they end up with an entirely different color. It's very visible from space. But apparently, this train bridge is, bridge is going to be dismantled in the near future. So it's going to be interesting to watch the mixings of these two big sluggish bodies of water. Uh, Salt Lake City is just down in the south here with the ring of mountains around it, uh, really dramatic setting. Up here are the Bonneville Salt Flats right there, where all the land speed records have been set. And if you look carefully, you can see uh, another man-made feature cutting across the Great Salt Desert here of I-80, the Interstate 80, cutting right across. And coming a little further down, right on the border between the mountain and the plain um, is Colorado. And right here is Denver. If you look, you can see the new airport uh, just opened recently outside of Denver. Uh, to the north is uh, Boulder, Colorado here. Again, some uh, great skiing just over to the left here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and down to the south, uh, Colorado Springs. And down in the lower left corner, uh, with a little bit of snow on the top, Pikes Peak. And as a rookie on board, it was absolutely amazing to be able to see the world every 92 minutes. You know, you hear about it, but the world rolls by tremendously fast, and it was just terrific to be able to see not only North America, which I've seen most of flying airplanes around, but to see all of Africa and to see Everest a dozen times. It was just an incredible experience. And another advantage of every 90 minutes is that you get to see the sun rise or set every 90 minutes. Another thing that amazed me from space was just how thin the atmosphere is. I mean, we were only a little over 200 miles up, and the atmosphere is way, way below us. It's just the thinnest of veils around the Earth. But looking through it, uh, highlighted by a sunrise or a sunset, you could see all the individual layers. And some days, uh, it would just be kind of a gradual fade of colors. And then some days, like this one, you'd actually see distinct bands. And since we were our orbit was tipped quite an angle to the sun, the sunrises and sunsets lasted quite a while. So it was just a beautiful thing to watch. And everyone says that this picture doesn't do us justice. It is just the most beautiful rainbow of colors uh, that you can imagine. It's gorgeous. <laughs> 